Swiss Robert Oppenheimer witnessed the successful denotation of the world's first nuclear weapon, he was haunted by its implications. I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Now I am become death, the destroyer of the worlds. I suppose we all thought that. One way or another, Oppenheimer was a man of many talents. He spoke eight languages, wrote poetry. Yet, he will forever be remembered as a father of the atomic bomb. The man who gave people the power to destroy themselves was haunted by his own creation. When people first met J. Robert Oppenheimer, what was immediately obvious to them was his intellect. A former colleague once said, the man was unbelievable. He always gave you the right answer before you formulated the question. Knowledge came easy to Oppenheimer. He learned Ditch in six weeks, just so he could give a lecture while on a visit to the Netherlands. He was born in New York on April 22, 1904, the older son of German-Jewish immigrants. His father, Julius, was a textile importer who became very wealthy. His mother was a painter whose family had been in New York for generations. He was raised in Manhattan on the Upper West Side in an apartment adorned with paintings by famous artists, including Van Gogh. After attending an elite private school in New York City, he went on to Harvard in 1922, intending to become a chemist but living with an appetite for physics, a thickle culture society school. He had been attracted to experimental physics after taking a course on thermodynamics at Harvard. As J. Robert and Frank began their elementary studies, they were sent to a prep school, but not just any prep school. In 1911, J. Robert entered the Ethical Culture Society School, an experimental school founded by social reformer Felix Adler. Its goal was not just to raise smart children, but children grounded in ethics who would go on to do great things. It was part of a larger secular humanist movement that was gaining momentum in education in the early 20th century and would heavily influence the lives of the Oppenheimer sons. Oppenheimer agreed with Einstein that German scientists could make a nuclear weapon, and when they did, Hitler was prepared to use it. America watched fearfully as the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939. In 1942, Oppenheimer was selected to direct the Manhattan Project, a top-secret U.S. Army project to develop the atomic bomb. He brought together the best minds in physics and eventually managed more than 3,000 people. He chose Los Alamos, New Mexico as the primary production facility because of its natural beauty. Before heading the Manhattan Project, Oppenheimer taught physics at both Caltech and the University of California, Berkeley, where he built the physics program and turned it into the hub for physics research in America. He had already been working on nuclear fission, the powerful release of energy caused by the splitting of an atom. The best element for splitting is the heaviest element found in nature, uranium. However, it's not a naturally occurring element and had to be manufactured. Reactors were built in southeastern Washington state to produce the plutonium. And then, on July 16, 1945, scientists detonated a plutonium bomb over the small town of Alamogordo, New Mexico. We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried, most people were silent. Never before had humanity possessed a weapon that posed a threat to global civilization. The test's success meant an atomic bomb was ready to be used by the US military. The following month, the US military dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. On August 6, 1945, the most powerful weapon in the world was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. 140,000 people were killed, many vaporized, thousands more would die in pain in the months and years that followed from radiation poisoning. Three days later, another bomb fell in Nagasaki, killing 74,000 people with equally devastating effects. Japanese Emperor Hirohito decried the devastating power of a new and most cruel bomb. 
Japan surrendered six days later, abruptly ending World War II. Oppenheimer initially expressed guilt over his creation. He said the weapon had dramatized so mercilessly the inhumanity and evil of modern war. He continued in some sort of crude sense which no vulgarity, no humor, no overstatements can quite extinguish. The physicists have known sin and this is a knowledge which they cannot lose. Yet a decade later, he appeared to distance himself from personal responsibility, pinning it on the estate, saying, I carry no weight on my conscience. Our work has changed the conditions in which men live, but the use made of these changes is the problem of governance, not of scientists. After the war, he became a key advisor on U.S. atomic policy. He headed the principal advisory committee of the successor to the Manhattan Project, the Atomic Energy Commission. The commission was a civilian agency in control of nuclear research and the development of nuclear weapons. He even had a desk in the president's executive offices across the street from the White House. But then, things began to turn against Oppenheimer. In December 1953, President Dwight Eisenhower ordered that a blank wall be placed between Dr. Oppenheimer and any secret data. Oppenheimer was suspected of being a communist spy. However, the onset of the Cold War brought renewed scrutiny. The Soviet Union conducted its first successful nuclear test in 1949, ahead of America's estimates. People within the government were suspicious of Oppenheimer. William Lescombe Warden, executive director of the United States Congress, joined comedy on Atomic Energy had sent a letter to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover concluding more probably than not J. Robert Oppenheimer is an agent of the Soviet Union. In 1954, Oppenheimer was called before a tribunal of the Atomic Energy Commission to explain his communist affiliations. It was a closed-door hearing that lasted four weeks. Oppenheimer maintained that he had not been ridiculized by his ex-partner and said his left-wing friends and associations simply gave him a sense of companionship, nothing more. He had never been a Communist Party member himself. Three board members hear this case. By a vote of two to one, they stripped him of his security clearance. He had used his position on the Atomic Energy Commission to lobby for international control of nuclear weapons to avoid a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. With his security clearance revoked, he settled in Princeton, New Jersey, where he still ran the Institute for Advanced Study, a research facility for postdoctoral fellows. He lived quietly until President John F. Kennedy invited him to the White House Dinner of Nobel Prize winners in 1962. Oppenheimer never won a Nobel Prize himself, though he was nominated for the prize in physics three times. When the Kennedy administration offered him a new trial to potentially get his security clearance back, he declined. Further evidence that the government was warming up to him came in 1963 when President Johnson awarded him one of the highest scientific honors bestowed by a president, the Fermi Award, which comes with $50,000 tax-free. In response, Oppenheimer said, I think it is just possible, Mr. President, that it has taken some charity and some courage for you to make this award today. Two years later, in 1965, Oppenheimer was diagnosed with throat cancer. He had been a notorious chain smoker all his life. The New York Times once described him as thin as the wisps from his chain smoked cigarettes or pipes. On February 18, 1967, he died at his home in Princeton. He was 62 years old. His wife took his ashes to the island of St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands where he lived for several months of the year and spread his ashes in the sea outside of their home in an area known today as Oppenheimer Beach. The 20th century marked a new age in which the very existence of humankind was threatened. That threat is more real than ever today with fears that Russia could use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. 
Today, Oppenheimer may be best understood as a man who would not rest until his questions were answered, only to see that some genies can be put back in the bottle. Hope you learned something and thanks for watching. Subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so you can never miss our video.